was certainly faithful in all his house as a servant because he gave, the testi gave a testimony pertaining to those things which were to be spoken after by God himself in Christ Jesus. Then he goes on to say, so he's saying that Moses was, was uh, brought forth uh, or came with a, a testimony that was pointing to Jesus, right? And what God will bring forth in Jesus. Then he goes on to the next verse, he says, but Christ was faithful as the son over his own house, being, being fully persuaded of God's faithfulness towards mankind to provide himself the lamb, to sanctify us from death. So Christ being offered as a lamb was to what? To sanctify us from death. Right? To sanctify us from death. To take away the burden of death away from man. Praise the Lord. Are you following? To sanctify us from death and also be fully persuaded of the Father's faithfulness towards him to raise him from the dead whose house we are, if truly our hearts are, apprehend, uh, are apprehended by him, being confident and rejoicing in the sure hope of his same life that endures to the end. you understand what they are saying here? Or how do you understand it? Can somebody, the verse 3, verse uh, 6, it says, but Christ was faithful as a son, over his own house, being fully persuaded of God's faithfulness towards mankind to provide himself the lamb to sanctify us from death and also being fully persuaded of the Father's faithfulness towards him to raise him up from the dead. Whose house we are, if truly whose house we are, if truly our hearts are apprehended by him, being confident by him. We being confident and rejoicing in the sure hope of his same life that endures to the end. Right? This version opens it up, explaining every bit of it. Right? They say, Whose house we are, if our hearts are apprehended by him, being confident and rejoicing. In the sure hope. So if our hearts are persuaded by the gospel, then what happens to our hearts? It becomes what? Confident. And it rejoices in what? The sure hope of the same life that endures to the end. Praise the Lord. So let's 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 talk about it. Let's let's think about something like this. The Bible said that at, when Adam ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what happened to him? His eyes were was open, right? To, to something. To his nakedness. He saw that he was what? Naked. So let's say uh, right now, we are all sitting here naked. Right? If somebody comes and comes and gives us yogurt, will it satisfy us? You may eat the drink the yogurt, but what is your heart looking for? What's your desire? Is it to eat yogurt? Okay, the person now brings car and gives it to you. What do you think you are looking for? Are you looking for a car or you want to be clothed? Now you are getting it, right? So what do you think your heart is looking for? If God, that God will cover our heart, your nakedness, that's what your heart is looking for. But you see, man has not understood what he's looking for. That's why sometimes we think, ah, what am I looking for? Right? We are trying to look for satisfaction in so many things. Right? We are trying to look, look for completion. The world is trying to look for completeness in so many things. Right? 
maybe you are, somebody say, no, my heart is looking for marriage. My heart is looking for this, then I'll be satisfied. You see, when I have children, I'll be satisfied. Or oh, when I have a car, I'll be satisfied. When I get jets, I'll be satisfied. When I become a billionaire, I'll be satisfied. It means that you are looking for completion in other things, right? Now, when, when, um, after eating the tree of knowledge of good and from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what is the next thing Adam did? When he saw that he was naked, he tried to cover himself. Right? So what did he use to cover himself? Fig leaves. Where did he find the fig leaves? Was it, was it in the world? It was in the world. So then he was looking to something in the world to cover what? His nakedness. Question. That nakedness, can it be covered by anything in this world? Eh? Have you thought of it? Can he cover his nakedness? The nakedness they are talking about. Can he cover it with anything that is in this world? Did he get fig leaves? Did he cover his nakedness? Then when God appeared, why did he go to hide? Because he said, I was, I, I was what? Naked. And I was ashamed. So I hid myself. But you have covered yourself with fig leaves. So how can you be naked and ashamed? Have you thought of it? So the fig leaves could not cover what? His nakedness. Right? So he needed something to cover his nakedness before his flesh can go to rest. Like he will be okay. Like I'm okay. The flesh, the flesh is saying that I'm naked. I need something to cover myself. Then I'll be okay. So if the flesh does not find the thing that will make the flesh okay, the flesh will continue to what? To look for that thing that will satisfy it. Now you understand it? Your flesh is mortal. The only thing that can satisfy this flesh is what? Immortality. So when we are talking about the clothing that can truly satisfy you or what your heart is truly desiring is immortality. And that's the word that, um, let's say, John will call it eternal life, right? Right? Eternal life. Right? He said, God has given us eternal life. And this life is where? In his son. Right? So he's showing you that your flesh is looking for something. Your heart is desiring something. And this world has made you believe that the thing that can take away your shame, the thing that can make you how you ought to be, the thing that can truly satisfy your life is if you come into this world and you get the best of this world. Right? And what they mean by the best of this world is that you have good clothes, right? Remember the story of the rich, rich man and Lazarus, right? What the, the, the Bible say about the rich man? He has the best things of this world, right? He's dressed in fine linen, right? Rich man's clothing. So, this world will tell you that what you are looking for, what your heart is desiring is what? Rich man's clothing. The Bible said he fed sumptuously. He fed sumptuously. So if you can have good food, if you can have, uh, you can go to, let's say, uh, La Palm, right? And be eating at La Palm every day, <laughs> like it's your kitchen. Praise the Lord. If you have that money, <laughs> you can go to La Palm, order any food that you want. You can sit down, they will serve you. You will eat. If you have that kind of life, then your heart will, will, will be satisfied. You have a good life. Praise the Lord. The word will say the good life is found in you eating sumptuous food, in you um, having nice clothing, in you having the best clothing, not just some clothing, right? The best clothing. When you are wearing lace, you see lace, expensive lace, expensive kente, not just it, they are going for a party and you are, you are wearing just normal, normal linen. No, no, no. Expensive kente and lace. You get me? 
if you go to a shop and they sell t a shirt for five CD, right? People will not take that shirt to party. Have you realized that? When they are going for a party, they will go to a boutique and look for ex a shirt that is expensive. Why? Because they want to look what? Expensive. Right? So, the world has what? Standards. They are saying that if you can have the best and the most expensive things of this world, right? Then you have what? A good life. Right? If you can have a wonderful wedding, so you find that they give birth to you, you come into this world, you are, when you grow a little, you're already dreaming of a, a nice wedding, five-star wedding, right? Thinking that if I have that life, it will what? Satisfy me. When people are having these five-star weddings, and you, you see them, right? Your heart desires that this is what I'm, my heart is looking for. This is what I'm looking for, right? And that can even shape your decision-making in the kind of man you want to date. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It can shape your decision making. Right? Even when men come and they say, oh, I, I like you, just look at them head to toe. Right? This guy cannot give me that wedding. <laughs> My heart is looking for some wedding. You are not God sent. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You can't handle me. Can you handle me? <laughs> you see, those, all these things are born from what? You... Praise the Lord. So, in, when you come to this world, they look to the kind of food you eat, the kind of clothing you wear, the kind of wedding you have, the kind of marriage you have, the kind of car you drive, the kind of visas you have, traveling around the world. You've been to America before. Have you been to America before? Right? Right? Even when people travel to America, they come to Ghana, their accent change. They want to speak like those in America because their heart feels that you being American is better than you being Ghanaian. You see, it's a good life. When they give birth to you in America, it's a good life. When they give birth to you here, I talk all. Hmm. Only your mobile. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So the man born in Choco, they look down on that man as my friend. You don't have a good life. From the start, look at you. You don't have a good life, right? I have a good life. I was born in New York, so I have a good life. You, Choco, no good life. <laughs> I hope you are getting me. So everybody, so people in Choco will then be asking God, God, why didn't, why didn't you allow Elon Musk to give birth to me? <laughs> what? Right? I think you have, sometimes you, have, you, you will be telling God, God, at least we should have this, you should make decisions as, as you coming into this world. Eh? I don't want to be born here. I, 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 I imagine myself being the son of Elon Musk and all those kind of nonsense, right? Why do people talk like Because they feel that Elon Musk has a good life. His children has, have, will have a good life, right? I can bet you if you should go to Elon Musk, you should go to his, his child and talk to his child. Yeah? He's also looking for something that will satisfy him. Right? In fact, uh, his father was even talking about it when his father was complaining that he has lost his son they are talking about the richest man in the world saying that he has lost his son and they asked him, but your son is alive how, how did you lose your son? he said, my son said, he's not a woman <laughs> look that's why when we're going to school they, they, they have this song, right? we match with this song uh, rich men envy the poor men Poor men envy the rich, right? Therefore, what is the sense in envying your neighbor? Life in this world is a great struggle, both for the and old, right? Even those who have great riches have troubles of their own, right? Once there is death in this world, there will be what? Trouble. Say trouble. Eh? 
We are all born into this world and there is death in this world. Whether you are rich or poor, I'm telling you that your life will not satisfy you. Where you were born will not satisfy you. I don't know if I'm making sense here. You can be born in the house of the richest man in this world. You can be born in the house of the poorest man in this world. But God has given us the chance to be on a level plane. Right? By sharing in his life. His life is the good life. Praise the Lord. There's no... When we are talking about a glorious life, that life is the life into which Christ was raised. That is the glorious life. The life that your heart is looking for, the life that will satisfy your heart, praise the Lord, is the life into which Christ was raised, resurrection life. Praise the Lord. Eternal life. Immortality. Praise the Lord. That's why Christ came. To illuminate the way unto life and immortality. Because that's the only thing that can satisfy your flesh. Like I said, if you are naked and I give you play, it won't satisfy you. If I, you are naked and I give you uh, yogurt, it won't satisfy you. Fried rice, it won't satisfy you. Praise the Lord. The best wine in this world, it won't satisfy you. The only thing that will satisfy you is a clothing that can cover your nakedness. So if in Adam we are naked, because Adam was naked, he covered himself with the things of this world and he was still what? Naked. Because the only person who can take away his nakedness is God. Because he has life in himself. And he has promised that life to man from the beginning. But the devil is convincing man to look for that life in this world. In his own ability. In the systems of this world. And so, when you don't have something in this world, you feel you lack something. Have you realized that? Huh? Yeah. That's why when you go to uh, meetings, let's say old school reunion, somebody will remind you of something that you lack. You, they meet you. Oh, so, <laughs> are you married? <laughs> God, they're looking at your finger. Are you married? Because maybe you are 19, uh, 90 year group. <laughs> so they're expecting that you are married. You have children. You have this. You have that. So are, are you married? So they're trying to show you that they, they are married. You are not. They are already exposing your nakedness. <laughs> Praise the Lord. They are seeing you naked. <laughs> if they want to insult you, they will look at your hand. They will look at uh, if you have children if, or a car or the kind of car that you brought to the uh, meeting. <laughs> right? They will say, ah, but we are bringing Mercedes Benz. Where car can you walk by? Hello? Okay, who are you? My Right? They are trying to insult you. They are <laughs> if somebody wants to insult you, for you to feel pain, you always look for something you don't have. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Why? Why? Because when he mentions something that you don't have, then you feel you, don't, you are not how you ought to be. Mm -hmm. And that's how you ought to be is what the Bible terms as justification. Now you understand it. Eh? Justification. And so he says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Being justified by what? Faith. Meaning, we are made how we ought to be, having the life of God through the faith of Christ Jesus. Right? And so we have what? Peace with God. What does it mean we have peace with God? It means in Adam, when Adam saw God, right, approaching, he went to hide. Why? Because he was naked and ashamed. But we can stand before God because now we are clothed in his glory. We have the sure hope of the resurrection. So we can stand before him in our nakedness and not be ashamed knowing that it is God who clothed us in the resurrection. Now you understand it? So our hearts, when he sees God, we see him as father, and so we see ourselves as his children. And we are not, you see, my, if I enter my room, my, my, my child, praise the Lord, that when she's naked, she will not go and look for something to cover herself. Because daddy is in the room. Right? My two-year-old will say, daddy, wait, wait, daddy, wait, 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 let me go and cover myself, wait, wait. <laughs> will my two-year-old do that? 
No. Because she's not conscious of what? Her nakedness. If she was, she grows and now she's conscious of her nakedness, she'll say, Daddy, wait, 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 wait. Am I lying? So now, Adam has become conscious of what? His nakedness. That is why he's hiding. So we can say, Adam, you have grown too fast. <laughs> right? I, <laughs> I didn't create you this way. <laughs> I created you to depend on me. In my eyes, you are always a baby. I want you to remain what? The baby. And God sees that as growth. Praise the Lord. I hope I'm making sense here. So, Adam, because he took the responsibility of clothing himself upon himself, now he's hiding from God. Meanwhile, it's not your responsibility to clothe yourself. It's God's responsibility to clothe you. But now we have seen that God is our father and God is, is the responsibility of God to clothe us. So now we can stand before God naked and not be what? Ashamed. Because we have this confident hope that God will clothe us with a body that cannot die. Now you get it. So that's why we say by the faith of Christ we have what? Justification. And we have what? Peace with God. Peace with God is not like God is angry with you and now God is not angry with you. Peace with God is that when you see God, you do not hide, knowing that you are what? Clothed in the same glory that he has. Praise the Lord. Even though it's not appearing. Praise the Lord. Even though you die. But it's like a lottery, right? When you win lottery, today, you're a millionaire. But the money is not in your account. But then you tell everybody, try Yesterday, I was hustling, but my hustling is over. Why are you telling that your hustle is over? Because you have a sure assurance or hope that that money will enter what? Your account. The same way we have what? Eternal life. Praise the Lord. But it's not yet what? Showing. Praise the Lord. Because we fall sick. We die. Praise the Lord. It's not showing. But then we know that in the appearing of Christ, praise the Lord, even if we die, he will raise us up from the dead. Praise the Lord. Now you, you, get, you, get, you, get, you get what I'm saying. So just, well, that's what we mean by justification. Justification simply means you are how you ought to be having the life of God. See, I'm how I ought to be. Having the life of God. So what do you think justifies? What makes you how you ought to be? The life of God. Praise the Lord. And that's why we rejoice. We rejoice in having the life of God. We rejoice in the sure hope of sharing in the same life that Christ has. We call it what? Sure hope. Praise the Lord. The hope of what? Eternal life. The hope of immortality. That's why, that's why we say Christ in me. The hope of glory. Right? Christ in me is the hope that I will be clothed in the same body that he has. That's the meaning of it. Right? Hope of glory is the same as hope of what? Immortality. Or hope of what? Eternal life. Praise the Lord. Glory there is talking about you being clothed in the glory that God has, which is what? Immortality. So when Christ was going to the cross, he prayed. That the father will clothe him with what? The glory. Right? And what did the father do? He raised him up from the dead. Giving him a body that cannot die. So what, what has the father done? He has clothed Jesus with what? Glory. Right? And how was Jesus so confident that he would get that glory? Because he, the father has promised it to man. Right? He has promised, promised eternal life to us. Right? But the person who will come and inherit that life for us, praise the Lord, is Christ Jesus. So he said, your body, you Christ, your body will not see what? Corruption. So he has read this from the scriptures and he knows that the father is what? Faithful. Praise the Lord. Let me read Hebrews uh, 5 verse 6 again. We started reading, that's the verse we started with, right? Knowing what I've said right now, read, let's read it again. It said, by Christ, was faithful as the son over his own house, being fully persuaded of God's faithfulness towards mankind. 
to provide himself the lamb to sanctify us from death and also being fully persuaded of the father's faithfulness towards him to raise him from the dead you see so he was fully persuaded that the father was raise him from the dead what do you think Jesus was looking at where did he know that the father was raising from the dead is it some, some meeting they had somewhere maybe in heaven somewhere <laughs> praise the lord it was in the scripture once Jesus will be born into this world Jesus himself must go and study what scripture that's why you see him in synagogues asking questions right yeah. it's not like Jesus was born with like when he was born he, then he knew everything like boom, everything was there because he's God no God became what man so now that he's man he has to go to what the Torah. He has to go and pick what? The scriptures. He has to go through what? The scriptures. But Jesus doesn't read the scriptures the way the Pharisee will be reading scriptures. Right? The Pharisees will read scripture to look for principles, things to do to, in order to have what? Life. A good life. They read it in order to have what? A good life. And that's the way many people preach today. They look to the Bible and then they look to the world and the good life that the world offers. And they ask from the Bible, what can I do to attain unto the things of this world? Praise the Lord. So, a preacher man will say, uh -huh, you don't have a car. But God is saying that, look, he's going to bless you with a car. You get me? Then they'll look for some scripture. Right? Adam was rich in what? Cattle. Adam was rich in what? Silver. Adam was free. And they said, Adam's blessing is yours. Ab Sorry. Abraham's blessing is yours. They used to say, Amen. Abraham's blessing is mine. So I'll get more car. More house. So what can I do? You have to be a tighter. You see? He said, if, if you want heaven to open, there are four things you need to do. So we are going to start. Number one. Pay your tight. Because he said, if you pay your tithe, then God will open the storehouse. You see? And then, he will pour you the blessing. So, your car and your house cannot come without what? Your tithe. Meaning the heaven is closed. Second one, your seed. The seed, the sacrifice. You see? When Abraham, um, Abraham put Isaac on the altar, you see? Then the heavens opened. God spoke. Look, heavens cannot open without sacrifice. So principle number two, sacrifice. Then they come number three, right? <laughs> Next week, they will come for more. <laughs> number five. <laughs> that one, they are come to talk about another thing. Marriage or childbirth or promotion in your office or your enemies in your house or Authors that we need to break because look, the Bible said this king, when he came, he he went and and scattered the authors. You see, there there are authors in your family house, your bloodline. You see, your father's house, your father's house. Look, they said this king. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. They said what? Say this king when he scattered the 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 authors. You see how they read Bible. So if you are going to scatter authors where in your village, praise the Lord. Because if you don't scatter that altar, <laughs> your life will not be good. You two, you want what? A good life. So that all night, you are coming to scatter what? Altars. That's the way people read Bible and preach. Praise the Lord. But that's not the way we read Bible and preach. <laughs> so Jesus was saying that said the scriptures, for you think that in them, you have what? Life. You can have a good life by observing the principles you can find in scripture. That's what he's trying to say. But they are there we testify of me. So when he says he's reading Bible, he's looking for the things that testify of him. He's saying that the scripture is talking about what? God giving man what? His life. And then how he will bring, bring that life to man. Praise the Lord. 
and all is centered upon me, the one who, whom he has elected to carry this plan out. So the whole, all of scripture is talking about who? Jesus. Praise the Lord. I hope I make sense here. I'm the one, that's why in the beginning he said that, let us make man. Let us make man. So the whole Bible is a project. God making man in his likeness. Right? So he said, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness. So the conclusion of all things, what will satisfy man, is what? God's likeness. We being clothed in a body that cannot die. We have a what? Eternal life. That is the good life. That's what Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is saying that. And you will not come to me that you have what? Eternal life. I'm the message of the Bible. <laughs> the one you have been reading every Sunday, every, every Sabbath. You go to the synagogue, you read. The person they are talking about is me. I've landed. <laughs> Yet you do not believe me. The only work that the Father requires of you is that you believe in the one whom he has sent. I've come to do the will of God. <laughs> to put away the body of death and to put on the body that cannot die. So that if man sees a body that cannot die, his flesh can go to rest. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So today, when we are preaching, we don't preach what? Things you have to do. Right? And somebody will be thinking, Derek, are you saying that we shouldn't give? We shouldn't do anything. Praise the Lord. That's not what I'm saying. Praise the Lord. The question is, we should ask ourselves, why do you do what you do? Because motivation means everything in Christianity. Praise the Lord. Am I trying to open heavens? No. As a believer, you are not trying to open heavens because you are seated in heavenly places. How can somebody sit in heavenly places going to open heaven? Praise the Lord. How did you get in the first place? Who opened it? Praise the Lord. So you see that open heavens is that's been message. You carry it to put in that's been. If you see open heavens conference, how to open your heavens, don't go to that conference. It's a waste of time. Praise the Lord. Because a believer is not going to open any heaven. Which heaven are you going to open? You are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So instead of you understanding these things, you are going to uh, programs where you are now going to open heaven. Based on your sacrifice, your righteousness. Then after doing that, you come to church and then you pick a microphone and sing him. My hope rests on nothing else but Jesus blood. And you are confusing yourself. Because Monday you went to program where you are, your hope was in your own righteousness to give yourself a good life. Praise the Lord. Rather than resting in what God has done, his righteousness to provide you with what? A good life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And because of that, your heart is not persuaded of the faithfulness of God. Your heart is not persuaded of God's love for you. Your heart is not persuaded that the life that God has given you is a good life. Your heart is not persuaded that the life of God, the life that God has given you is the only life that can satisfy you. So when you look at the things of this world, you are always in a place where you don't feel, where you don't feel complete. Always you are feeling incomplete. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And when you are incomplete, when you feel incomplete, your flesh will always look for something to complete itself. And that's where the works of the flesh comes from. I hope I make it sense here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I hope you are catching something. Does anyone have any questions so far? Any question? Have you digested what I've said so far? What does it mean to have peace with God? If you want to talk, you can pick a microphone so that those... Mm -hmm. I think to have peace with God is mm -hmm. to know that you have his life. To have his life. Correct. To have peace with God is to know that you have his life. Right? So you can stand before him with boldness because you and God look, look alike. Right? It's like, it's like, let me use like, 
Another example now to make people, people relate more of things of this world. Uh, you go to a party, and that party, you you stay around. Um, let's say you are. I'm not trying to look down on anybody, right? I'm trying to use things that people can relate to to, to explain spiritual truths, right? Because I believe that everybody here knows he's how he ought to be. Say, I'm how I ought to be. Having the life of God. So whether you are a doctor or you are a driver or you are uh, you sell cozy, praise the Lord. Eh? You cannot come to church and feel inferior to the doctor. I don't know if I make sense here. Eh? If you want to say bossu or you want to uh, show some humility, eh? show humility to both the doctor and the cozy seller. You can't meet a doctor and say, oh boss, oh boss. Then when you meet a cozy seller, eh, that boy go that. Praise the Lord. No, the respect you and the, the respect and the hand that you give to the doctor should be equal to the respect you give to the cozy seller. I hope I'm making sense here. If not, then we can say that you look to the things of this world for justification. Now you understand it. Means that you are looking to materialism as that which will make you as you ought to be. So you give respect to the person who has more. The person who has higher status in society. I hope I'm talking to somebody. Praise the Lord. And that is not genuine humility. That's not genuine love. I hope I'm making sense here. There's something behind what you are doing. You are saying boss so that when the person is feels honored, the person might release some 20, uh, 200 Ghana, right? 200 Ghana, one oh, chapel of boss. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I hope I'm making sense here. Yeah, two people come inside. You are not sure. Two people, one got down from Range Rover. The other was walking. He was walking. She shared way, yeah. Praise the Lord. From, from, from the gates. And they are all entering. We'll see how you treat both. Right? You send one to the front. Right? Where they, the pastor, the, the chief, uh, the chief, the uh, elders, uh -huh. because he got down from Range Rover, you are bringing to elder, elder. Be one new convert neighbor, so I'm going praise the Lord. I claim my elder said, <laughs> You want to package or praise the Lord? Yeah, car. So with the car, you are bringing the guy to the front and then the one with the child walking to the back. When the guy is trying to even come forward and say, No, 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 be a tap be a empty chair. So be a tap, yes, yes, yes. This one camera capture. Go back. Praise the Lord. And then when we come, we, we start singing, we are shaking one another, and then you go around, I love you with the love of the Lord. Oh, I love you with the love. You don't have love. How can you love somebody with the love of the Lord? God will say that with your mouth, you praise me, but your heart is far away from me. You don't know me. Neither do you have the fruit of my life. My character is not in you, because me, I'm, very, I'm, I'm God. I don't I have no respecter of persons. So if you are my child, and I bring forth my character in you, you'll be a no-respecter of persons. Meaning that you deal with everyone equally. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody. Eh? And that's where God is bringing you. That's what God is working every day to bring you, to bring you to a place where you are like him. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. That's the plan of God. And that's why he gave us who? Christ Jesus. So that by seeing that your life is already complete, Praise the Lord. You will not be converting the things of this world and you will not be converting things from people so that it will, it will influence who you show respect to. Yeah. Are you getting me? If, you're, if, if, uh, if you're already rich, having, you're a billionaire and somebody gets that from uh, Range Rover, will you go and say, boss, Uh, we go and say boss to get two hundred Ghana. Uh, so if you say boss to that person, it's, it will be genuine. Now you get it. Yeah, because but Range Rover bought him to my five. 
You can buy five right now. <laughs> but you saw the guy, and, and as an usher, you saw, he said, Charlie Boss, welcome, welcome. Please, you can sit here. The Charlie wanted person to come. Welcome, you can sit by the Range Rover man. <laughs> right? Yeah. If the Range Rover man is even look at the guy like this, why are you bringing this guy to come and sit by me? You can tell that this guy, if you can lay a neighbor, praise the Lord. When you go outside, you go for programs outside, then you can choose where you will sit and who will sit by you. Once you come to church, we are one body. Say one body. Right? There's no rich. There's no poor. Praise the Lord. There's no male. There's no female. Praise the Lord. It's only what? One body, one spirit. Praise the Lord. We treat everybody equally. And that's the character of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And because we are filled with God's character, we give. Because we are filled with God's character, we give. And we give genuinely. We don't give to get something in return. Because we know that God does not supply our needs according to what we are giving, but according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We know that God supplies our needs. As children, God will always give you see, if my daughter goes to school, she has a choice. She can choose to share her biscuit or not. Follow me carefully. But because she knows, right, that tomorrow I'll put new set of biscuits in the bag. She's persuaded, she's confident that I'll do it. Why? Why do you think she, she, she's confident that I'll do it? Because she has seen my character. She has seen the kind of father she has. Right? She knows that, the, she know that this, this my father, she, she, he always puts biscuits in the bag. Right? Because he, he, he cares so much about what I'll eat in school. So when she goes, do you know what she will do? She will share the biscuits. When she's okay, she will share it. She will see her sharing the biscuits. She doesn't bring it home to come and store it. <laughs> I hope I make sense here. If she was an orphan, she would bring the rest of the biscuit home to store it because she survives by the strength of her own hands. Am I making sense here? But because she's not an orphan, but she has a father who provides for her, she's confident that that father will provide for her tomorrow. Oh, I'm making sense. So she doesn't give because I'll provide for her. She gives because she knows she has a father who cares for her. Praise the Lord. Eh? It's not a formula she's running. It's a consequence of knowing that she has a father. And the one who does not have the father also knows that he doesn't have a father. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So that he, he has to survive on his own. So when you go to that person, you say, give me one of your, you say, hey, I should give you one. Your chairman, your chairman, I can't do it. I survive by my own strength. I can't. I have to save this one for tomorrow. I have to save this one for tomorrow. This one for next week. This one for next month. So you budget here. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I hope I'm making sense here. Yeah, yeah. I have to do this. I have to do this. Say, oh, just give me one. No, 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 no. Okay, let me tell you something. When you give me one, eh, I, I, I caught some revelation. When you give me one, eh? God said he will give you two. When you hear that, he said, hey, is it true? He said, yes. Because he believes that that's your father. He has seen some investment uh, formula, right? A, an investment firm <laughs> where you can invest something to it and get double. A men's goal kind of thing. Praise the Lord. What do you think that person will do? He will do it. Will you say that he loves, he loves, he loves me, so he gave me the biscuit? Eh? No, that person is looking for more. His heart is coveting for more. That's why he gave. Praise the Lord. So not all giving is an act of love. Some is an act of covetousness and self-love. Praise the Lord. How about making sense here? Uh, give it, give it microphone. Thank you very much, Pastor, Pastor Eric. Yeah. Um, thank you for directing the word. In fact, I'm really receiving it. God bless you. You're welcome. Uh, I want you to touch on this for me. Uh, I've heard this people say it on 
television um, when they when they are in, interviewed mm. then they ask you how are you faring mm. then they come by uh, admin ashi i don't know how to say it in english um, uh, how do you english say it admin ashi by grace and strength come again but by grace and being careful by grace and being, and being careful, careful. Uh, okay. so all that you are saying mm. is just up uh, or is i mean written to God's provision for us mm -hmm. and we must be conscious of what is provided for us and live upon up that rest mm -hmm. or that, that provision mm -hmm. but some people are also saying that because of their carefulness aside the provision God has given them is what's taking them I mean taking them through what they are going so uh, how do we resolve that because uh, yes yes they think so right they are combining they, they are very good because the aspect is also part because mm -hmm. much, much, they have been careful. That's why they are very good. Yeah. Aside the grace, uh -huh, or yeah. God's provision. You see, when it comes to let, let's let, let, when it comes to giving, eh, until you see and you are persuaded that is the life of God that makes you how you ought to be. You can't give. It's impossible. You can do a form of giving which is by small giving. It's stinginess. You see, stingy people are not only those who keep. Stingy people also give. You see, when we see stinginess, we think stinginess is someone who holds it. No. You can be stingy in giving to. Right? It's all down to what? Motivation. What is motivating the person? Right? That's why I started from justification. I'm saying that what truly makes you how you ought to be is what? The life of God. So if you feel what makes you how you ought to be are the things of this world, what do you think you hold on to? Eh? What do you think you hold on to your chest? If this is life, these are the things of this world. And I feel life is what justifies me. I hold it tight. Then I, I give you this one. Follow me carefully. And if I feel that the things of this world is what justify me, I hold this one tight. Right? And this one, I don't need it. <laughs> you can, if, if anything, you can take it. But this one there, I hold it there. You see how the thing works? So Jesus will come and say, life does not consist of the abundance of possessions. The very thing that will justify you is minus possessions. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The, that's why I said that you can either laugh money or you love God. You can't love both. You see? He's saying that it is God who justifies you. So you can either hold him dear to your heart so that we can let go of money. That's why he told that rich man, go sell all your things to them and give to the poor and come and follow me. He went away sorrowfully because that man believes that it is the money that makes him how he ought to be and not following Jesus. Now you get me? But he didn't know that it is Jesus who makes you how you ought to be and not your abundance or possessions. That's why he went away sorrowfully. So people give with sorrow, not cheerful. They are not cheerful when they are giving. You know why? They are just like the man who went away. That, those people are not following Jesus. Their heart is in the things of this world. They believe that the things of this world is what will justify them. It's what will make them how they ought to be. Oh, I'm making sense here. That's the foundation, what, where giving comes from. Praise the Lord. You can't release something that justifies you. You can't release it. You keep it dear to your heart. So if you value life over money, you love Jesus. Because the life is where? In him. God has given us eternal life and this life is where? In his son. So Jesus said, where your treasure is, that is where your heart will be also. So which one is your treasure? The things of this world, the gold of this world, <laughs> all my life, all my gold, because Jesus' treasure is what? Life. He values life. And so he's asking, who loves life? Who loves life? That he will see many good days. You see? Who loves life? Not everybody loves life. There are people who love what? The things of this world. Over life. They love their greetings in the marketplaces. <laughs> That's why I say, war to you Pharisees. Right? You, you, you love greetings in marketplaces. 
when you pass and people say, hey boss, hey boss, you like it. It makes you feel good. <laughs> That's you are how you ought to be. When they say, oh, we have we have this, this doctor in our midst. We have this, this doctor in our midst. I want you to honor him. Then you get up like this. Praise the Lord. You feel all cool, right? <laughs> Those are the things that you, that's why when they, they don't mention Dr. for me, if, right? When they say, uh, let's, let me introduce Kofi, Kofi Nyako. Eh, where the doctor? <laughs> our doctor, our doctor. <laughs> why? Because you like the, 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 the stature, the honor that they give, so you're offended. But the man who finds justification in life, even when you don't bring doctor, he does not care. You don't bring apostle, he does not care. He doesn't care about titles because he's how he ought to be having the life of God. Now you get you hear what I'm saying. Good. So people find excuses for not giving. Some is let me be careful. You see, I have to be careful. You see, or like we are saying, let me do this. Let me you see uh, uh, the economy is hard. That this is that is that it's all born from stinginess. It, they don't want to release their money. Simply because they feel it is that which what justifies them. Look at um, uh, the Macedonians. The Bible said even in their deep poverty, they gave. Now, imagine you are poor. Eh? And how you ought to be is to be what? Rich. If I come and tell you to give, will you give? You need to get hold, hold the money then I come and tell you that Jesus, even though he was rich, he became poor. That you might be rich. And I tell you that you see, Jesus became poor so that you'll be rich. So the way you can be rich is also you too, you must give. You see? When you give, then you can tap into the riches that Christ brought to you. Would you believe it? You believe it and you will give. But that giving is stinginess. Because the riches, the riches that Christ brought to you is not money. The riches that Christ brought to you is that which will clothe you and satisfy you, which is what? His life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I hope I'm making sense here. So these people, the Macedonians, they believed that they were rich. Even though physically, by the standards of this world, they are what? Poor. But they were persuaded that they are what? Rich. How are they rich? They have the life of God. And they believe that that life is what makes them how they ought to to be so they can release the money that they have right there how do you know this if you go and read the bible said these people were rejoicing in hope you know what it means to to rejoice in hope to rejoice in eternal life their joy is from eternal life it's not from money so when they are dancing in church when you may see that yeah baby it's not the amount that they have maybe they receive their paycheck <laughs> Like the way the nurses will dance when they release some money. Praise the Lord. Are you guys hearing me? They, they, are, they are not dancing because it is money. They are dancing because they have what? Life. Meaning when our robbers break into their house today, and still the little that they have, they will come back and dance the same way as if they have received five million dollars. And you ask, ah, so you, you have problem. People came to your house. They came to steal from you. And you are here hold, holding hand and dancing. Oh, you are here that here, baby. I don't, we don't understand what is wrong with you. <laughs> what, what are you living in denial? <laughs> we, we don't understand, but you are replicating the same life that was put on display in Paul and Silas. Can't you see? They are in chains, they are in prison, and they are praising God. Does it make sense? Eh? You are you are not how you ought to be, be in prison according to what standards, right? But you are there praising God. Where is that joy coming from? Yeah. from the life by, by the hope you believe in that you, you are going to share in the same life into which Christ was raised you are going to share in eternal life that gives you what? joy and that life nobody can touch it not even prison can touch it not people lying on, about you can touch it not people gossiping about you can touch it no amount of gossip can touch it no amount of uh, 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 insult can touch it it cannot injure it so it is something which is permanent, meaning when the troubles, the tribulation of this world come upon you, you can still be what? You can still be at peace. You can still have what? Good cheer. Say good cheer. What did he say? 
He said, be of good cheer. Did you say? He said, in this world, you have what? Tribulation. You have trouble. But be of good cheer. Well, how am I going to be of good cheer? Then Paul will also come. And Paul will say, and in all things, <laughs> give thanks to God. Ah, Paul, are you serious? <laughs> in all things, people will come and say from me, he said, I should give thanks to God in all things. Right? I, I'm not married. They said I should give thanks to God in all things. I don't have a car. He said I should give thanks to God. They just bounce my visa. He said I should give thanks to God in all things. You see, that thing doesn't make sense. Then he goes on to, on to say, for this is the will of God concerning you. Away! Praise the Lord. <laughs> I, can't, I can't understand this thing. How can you say that is the will of God concerning me? That I should give thanks. When things are not going well in my life. When my, my, I just lost my child. <laughs> Think about it. These are serious issues. Because in this life, you can encounter so many things, right? I'm telling you, he didn't say that when you become a Christian, you don't go through any trouble. He said, when you go through the trouble, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I'm the one who brings bring forth endurance in you. I'm the one who brings forth joy in you, even in the midst of trouble. But how am I going to do this? I've given you life. If your heart values this life and that which will justify you, you can have joy in all things. Now you understand it. And that joy is your strength. That's why we say the joy of the Lord is my strength. So what strength do you need to give? The joy of the Lord. What strength do you need to endure? The joy of the Lord. What strength do you need uh, to, uh, uh, to go to church? The job of the Lord. What strength do you need to be in the choir? The job of the Lord. It's not when you can't the choir. Somebody insults me. I've had enough. I've had enough. I won't take this thing anymore. I will not sing anymore. I'm, I'm leaving this choir. I'm happy to this. You get what I'm saying? I'm saying, I won't do this again. I won't do this again. In Lado, right? Then you are start threatening people. My friend, you don't have strength. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If you saw the life of God as that which justifies you, and you find satisfaction in that life, then that life will give you what? Joy. And that joy, because no, no, no insult can touch it. When they insult you in the choir, you still have what? Joy. So it can cause you to endure and stay in the choir, even though people are what? Insulting you. I hope I'm making sense here. It's not a reporting matter. If you come and report to me, I'll give you the same counsel. <laughs> if you take it to Holy Spirit, we'll give you the same counsel. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Because maybe you, are, you, th you think that uh, what will satisfy me in that moment is that Derek will call the person and blast the person. Or can we blast like a can? Mm-hmm. 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 You try can no touch if you talk no jelly. Me, Mali, you want to insult the person, but you want me to come and do that damage for you. So that you feel satisfied. Oh, three by no me. Then when you come, we, see, we put on the forgiving one another. Even as God in Christ has forgiven me. You see, people <laughs> hey, people don't understand Christianity. I'm telling you, they, they are just playing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And for this thing, I can't forgive. I can't forgive. And for this thing, I can't. what did the person do? Praise the Lord. What did the person do that you can't forgive? Did he touch eternal life? Eh? 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 Did he touch eternal life? He didn't. So how come you are saying you can't forgive? Then you don't understand. Oh, let any boy can fail me. Oh, let any boy can fail me. Did he touch your eternal life? <laughs> so if he didn't touch your eternal life, you can forgive. Think about it. Because whatever he did to you cannot injure the life that God has given you. That life is permanent. Praise the Lord. Say permanent. That joy is permanent. Nobody can touch it. The joy that God gives you, nobody can touch you. The hope that God you have in Christ, nobody can touch it. Praise the Lord. And that's why we say, will your anchor hold in the storms of life? Praise the Lord. That's what you are talking about. That we have an anchor that keeps us, our souls, steadfast and sure while the 
there be low roll, right? So what problems come? We have what? An anchor. It stabilizes us. Praise the Lord. While you are giving us trouble, we are still stabilized like Christ on the cross. On the cross, Christ was very stabilized. Can't you see? It takes a stabilized person to forgive his enemies. They are beating you. They are slapping you. They are spitting on you. They are calling you names. And Jesus is so stabilized that he is saying, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they are doing. Can you do it? Oh, a cross in a long time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You say, ah, oh, me, 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 dying for you people. Look at the way you are treating me. Eh? Look at the way you are treating me. I'm on the cross because of you. All this thing because I want to save you people. I'm saving you people. Look at the way you are insulting me. I'm saving you people. Are, are, are you getting me? I'm the one, I'm the one. Last time you, this guy, I healed you. I healed you. And today, look, you say, crucify me. Ungrateful person. Hey, this one, they don't do anything for people. Don't do that. You go and put it on your status. Don't, don't, do, don't do things for people. They are, they are very, these are ungraceful people. They don't even say thank you. They don't even say, your own is thank you. They know I get crucified. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And yet, he's saying, Father, forgive them. My friend, I said, look, we have to reevaluate the kind of Christianity that we have. Praise the Lord. We must check if we are truly sharing in the same belief which was in Christ Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. Because if we share the same belief, do you know what it will do to us? It will make us like him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, you can talk. Thank you. Um, um, I'm on the same, like, your, what, what, when about finishing, you talk about forgiveness. Yeah. I know in the church also people are bound in forgiving because they had learned and they are recited even as uh, when they were schooling mm. that if you don't forgive, the Lord, the Lord will not forgive you. Yeah. So even if, if they are forgiving, mm. because they want to forgive because they need forgiveness from, from God, then they have to buy, they have no choice to forgive you because they want God to forgive them. Mm. Yeah. So, so can you talk, touch on that? Yeah. Mm. If, 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 if you are uh, if you are forgiven so that God will forgive you, then that forgiveness is not coming from your heart. Right? It's like, I do something to my sister, and then she goes to report to my father, and my father takes the key. Say, if you don't forgive your sister, I'll give you lashes. So I turn to my sister, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I can't forgive you, but I'm sorry. But you see that that sorry is not coming from where? Like, the sorry I'm saying is not coming from my heart, right? And she will be know that this thing I'm saying there is KNL. Praise the Lord. But the life, you see, life, the life, the, forg the forgiveness, the way you forgive people is born from the life that God will bring forth in you. Right? It's not you who is doing the forgiving. It's not you who is loving the people. You, you are dead. You have been crucified with Christ. By sharing in the faith of Christ, by sharing the same belief that he has when he was hanging on the cross, praise the Lord. Do you know what that belief will do to you? It will crucify you with Christ. Let me explain this very well. That's why Paul will say that I've been crucified with Christ. It's not I that live it. It's not I, me, Paul, that live it. So when you see me forgiving people, uh, it's not me. Oh. <laughs> it is Christ that lives in me. The life that I live, that is coming to show you where it's coming from. I live by the faith of the Son of God. So if you want to live like Jesus, what should you be looking for? Faith of the Son of God. Eh? That's why you say we are saved by grace through what? That faith there is the faith of who? The Son of God. So then, how can I share in the faith of the Son of God? That is what they are communicating with the cross. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The cross has what? A message. That message that they are communicating is what will give you what? That faith. They are revealing that belief which is in the heart of Jesus to you. Praise the Lord. Eh? I, I've seen some picture when I was just narrating about Simon, right? The person who was going to help Jesus at the cross. 
Can somebody Google the name, the meaning of that name for me? Uh, Google it for me. You see something. You see, the problem that the church has, right, when I'm talking about church, not like Calvary, like church, right, is that uh, they preach, when they are preaching the cross, <laughs> they think the cross is something that, you see, when you finish preaching, they have to go ahead. There are more things that we need to go and learn. You see, Jesus, after the cross, then we'll go to other messages. <laughs> I don't know if I make sense here. No. The only message that the Bible has is called the message of the cross. Right? That cross, Jesus hanging on the cross, can answer every question you want to ask God concerning man, concerning God. If you ask me a question concerning God, eh, I don't go and flip scriptures looking for so many things like scriptures to try and support my view or try to look for answers. Do you know what, where I go? Straight to the cross. It won't take me five minutes, I'll give you an answer. Because in the cross is the manifold wisdom of God. In the cross, God is communicating to man about himself, about man, about what man needs to be satisfied, about so many things, right? It's all being answered in the cross. And all this belief, or all, all these answers, or all, all this knowledge is found in the person hanging on the cross. Praise the Lord. He's laying it down for us to see what he believes. So that when you understand what he has in his mind, praise the Lord, or his belief system, praise the Lord, then you can also say, I have what? The mind of Christ. I hope I'm making sense here. So when we say I have the mind of Christ, you're not saying, uh, you see, when people are going to write exam, you know what they say? I have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is not science. Praise the Lord. Or biology. Praise the Lord. The mind of Christ we are talking about is, is what Christ knows when he was hanging on the cross. What he believes when he was hanging on the cross. Praise the Lord. What is what, what he knows, the knowledge he possesses. Praise the Lord. When he was hanging on the cross. They are now putting it, they are laying it to bear. Praise the Lord. Like I said, if you want to truly know a person, praise the Lord. It's not in the good times. To really know a person is in the bad times. When things are not going well. When you squeeze the person, what will come out of the person is really that person. True or false? All of us can say we are humble. Because I squeeze the Praise the Lord. So on the cross, what did Jesus believe? <laughs> That's the question we should be asking. What did Jesus show that he believes? And and that belief is true on the scriptures. I can show you. That belief is true on the scriptures. That's why we say it's a particular faith. It's a particular belief. It's true on the scriptures. That's where you find that that belief is in Hebrews 11. Right? We say by faith. By faith. Noah. By faith. By faith. Right? Now, we said that we used to, you need that faith. The same faith that Abraham. All those people were sharing. The same faith that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego we're sharing. You too, you need it. If you get it today, you, you are not living anymore. Somebody else has taken over. What is that faith? How does it look like? What is the faith of the Son of God? What is the belief which was in Jesus when he was hanging on the cross? Because uh -huh. that God could raise him from the dead. He believed that God could raise him from the dead. And what does that glory or that life represent to him? What is it to him? Is it stranger? I want you to come to a place where if you are singing, Mi wa yesua, Mi wa di inara, praise the Lord. It should mean something to you. Not that we are singing, so you two are singing. No. It should be true to you. So that if today we strip you of everything, we take your car, we take your house, you lose your job. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Can you sit down and then sing the same song? Mi wo yesua. Mi wo yesua. Praise the Lord. Will you sing it? Eh? Do you believe that you still have everything? <laughs> eh? 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 <laughs> if God, look, these are the things the Bible is 
city. That's why you have the story of Job. You think the story of Job is a very nice story and they decide to get put in the Bible. No. The guy has been stripped of everything. <laughs> he has lost his children. He has lost his business. He has lost everything. And the only person they left for him is his wife. And the wife is the one that they're always going to use. <laughs> He's going to tell him, my friend, seeing that you have lost everything, your life is worthless. My friend, you are hopeless. <laughs> Just curse God and die. <laughs> Yeah, yes, curse God. And die. Do you know what the guy said? Right? I've lost everything. I've lost like all the material things that the things that people find justification in. But then I've not lost the very thing that I find justification in. That's what uh, uh, Job is saying. My redeemer still lives. He's talking about Christ, he's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about that there's a life that is in Christ Jesus. And it doesn't end there. He said, now, I will see him in the flesh. Meaning that even if I die, he will raise me up in a body that cannot die. I will see him face to face. That alone is everything to me. And he sustained you. The only thing that can sustain you in this world, where you will not fear anything that can happen to you in this world. Do you know people live in fear? People fear, hey, they will sack me. What if they sack me? What if the economy, the dollar is going high? Oh. It will cut 20. It will happen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hey, hey, this will happen. My friend, I'm saying that you can, be, you can be stabilized in this economy. You can be stabilized in this world. No matter what will happen. When you say that, what can happen to me? Even when man kills me, God will raise me out from the dead. And that's the, the things that the apostles were saying. Right? And that was in the, that's the belief which was in the heart of Jesus. So what did he do? He did not lift a finger to preserve his own life on the cross. Now you understand it? Eh? He's revealing the way unto life. How you enjoy the good life which is in Christ Jesus. He's showing you how. He's saying that look at the Father. Look at the life that the Father has. That is the life that can justify you. That is the life that can satisfy you. Now look at the life that the world offers. Eh? Look at the good things that this world can offer you. Can it satisfy you? Can it satisfy you? Okay, then look at me on the cross. Me, Jesus, on the cross. They are telling me. They are tempting me. It's called temptation. Choose what or God. Where is your heart? If your heart is in the world, save yourself. Save yourself. Save yourself. Anybody who loves the things of this world, he fears death. He preserves his own life. True or false? Eh? The rich people, why do you think they don't want to die? A Mercedes Benz, a Tesla, a small nation, he prays a lot. And now, he won't carry no care. He wants to carry the Tesla to the grave and go through the grave and go to the afterlife. Praise the Lord. I hope I make sense here. He's some sure food. He doesn't want to lose it. I hope I make sense here. That's why they fear that they don't want to die. Praise the Lord. He loves the things of this world. What do the Bible talk about loving the things of this world? He said, when you love the things of this world, the love of the Father is not in you. You can't tell me you love God. You live your life as an enemy to God. Why? Because you find justification in the things of this world. You say that when I have the things of this world, I am how I ought to be. I hope I'm making sense here. And Jesus on the cross, he's looking at the life that the Father has. He's looking at the life that the world can offer him. And he's saying that, look, with the life that the world that can offer, offer me cannot cover my nakedness. The life that the Father has is what covers my nakedness. Praise the Lord. So when they were tempting, lift a finger to save yourself. Lift a finger to save yourself. The way Adam did in the garden. When he lifted a finger to clothe his own nakedness. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And covered himself with fig leaves, thinking that is how he ought to be. And to God appeared and he saw that he was naked. He wasn't like God. He wasn't like God. Praise the Lord. I said we find our satisfaction and justification in what? In the likeness of God. We being clothed in the glory or the likeness or the immortality or the eternal life of God. Praise the Lord. So Jesus, that's why he didn't save himself. I'm showing you what is in Jesus' heart <laughs> and the reason why he didn't come down from the cross. 
They are tempting him. With, you know how the Bible put it? He was tempted at all points, yet without sin. Do you know what sin is? To save yourself. To clothe yourself like Adam. Praise the Lord. To come to a place where you think that in your own ability you can clothe yourself. To lift up a finger to preserve your own life. Rather than committing your desire to be clothed into the hands of God. You know what Jesus did? Instead of saving himself, what did he do? He said, Father, into your hands I commit myself. You see what he's doing? He's saying that the way unto life is not in you saving yourself. The way unto life is in you handing yourself over to the one who is able to lift you up from the dead. Amen. I hope I'm making sense here. And he said that if you believe the same thing, that's what we call belief. People say, oh me, I believe. I believe in Jesus. <laughs> I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. And that's why they will say that even the, uh, the, demo, the, devils, the demons believe and they shudder. Right, that's what James was trying to tell them. He said, look here, my friend, when I look at you people, you are, and, uh, you are saving yourself, yet you say you believe in Jesus. It's very confusing. <laughs> when I look at you, you are saving yourself. It's like people who say, we are Christians, yet they are living under the law. Right? They are trying to preserve their own lives. That's what it means to be under the law. They still depend on self-performance. Self-performance, self-effort. Self-effort. You are trying to preserve your life. You are saying that, if I do good, I will have eternal life. That's what you are saying. So you are saying that the life that your heart desires is in your own ability to supply it. Can you do it? Can you do it? If you are the one doing good, who is living? Christ or you? You yourself. Have you been crucified with Christ? No. So can you, can you expand a, a bit the, what the law is? Um, morality. Morality. Is it part of the law? I mean, how does it... Can you expand a bit what the law is? It's a very is? good question. It's simple here. Yeah, the law in itself is not bad. The law is good. The law is holy. Praise the Lord. In fact, the law, the first thing that the law will teach you, you know what the law is trying to tell you? To fear God. That's why it is good. It's telling you don't save yourself, but then you are using it to save yourself. Do you know what the law says? Can you somebody tell me about the Ten Commandments? What's the first commandment? Love the Lord thy God with what? With all your, with all your, with all your, and I'm saying that, how, what will make you love God? You see, when, I, when, when, when you say, when you see the love that he loves you, and all those things, it still, it still needs to be broken down. You see, I've brought it down to, um, I've broken it down to uh, that sentence you just said. I've broken it down to like, like, no cry, so that we'll see what he's talking about. Like, how do you, can you say, uh, I'm loving, I will love God with all my heart. Or let me say, can you, in your ability, love God? No. So what will make you love God? Fear. If you love him, you fear him. Uh -huh. So what, what, what will make you fear him? What will make you love him is the same thing that will make you fear him. You know, I've been speaking about this thing for one hour, almost one hour now, right? The very thing I'm asking you is what I've been talking about. <laughs> eh? You know that. Uh, 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 ah, somebody said something. I heard something from you. Thank you. Justification. It's when you see that it is his life that will make you as you ought to be. Uh, wait, uh, let me ask you a question. Who here uh, struggle to love money? He says that you can either love God or money. So who here struggle to love money? Because at one point in time, all of us here, we love money. If it's something that you've been sitting here, so they love it. Hey, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If today they are, they, somebody can say, take one million dollars and betray uh, Derek right now. They will ask when. <laughs> Am I like? <lying>? Eh? <laughs> eh, I'm saying that if you are like that, you love money. That's what I'm saying. You think why did Judas betray Jesus? Because he loves money. Did money love Judas? Did he see the love that the money has for him? 
Then he fell in line with money. <laughs> eh? So how do you, did you fall? The, way, the same way you fell in line with money. It's the same way you fall in love with God. Now you understand it. And so Jesus is trying to show us how we fell in love with money. Because our heart was saying that if I have money, I have all things. That's what you are saying. You are, I'm how I ought to be if I have money. And if your, you, your, your idea of a good life is how the world sees a good life, praise the Lord. That's why you see all the parables of the rich man, the rich man in Lazarus. Do you think if you ask the world, which life do you want? Which one would they choose? Who would choose Lazarus? Eh? Everybody would choose rich man. Why do you want the rich man's life? Because you say that's a good life. I don't like the Lazarus one. Even if we, are, we say we are acting play, this one is not even real. Play poor God some more. Praise the Lord. Play, just play Lazarus part so that Andrew play the rich man. He say, no, 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 no. Why are you giving me Lazarus part? I mean, I want the rich man's part. Banque no buy here already. Praise the Lord. I hope I'm making sense here. You are saying that if I'm eating sumptuously, I am feeding sumptuously, I am, are you getting me? That's a good life. And God is saying that, no, you have it wrong. The good life is eternal life. Now you understand it. So if you believe that the good life is eternal life, you will not be forcing yourself to fall in love with Jesus. Your heart is already loving God. Now you understand it. And if you believe that the good life is the life that the world can offer you, is the money that you have. Praise the Lord. If we say, close your eyes, imagine a good life. What do you see? Some people are already in Dubai. <laughs> right? Meaning you don't even know what a good life is. Praise the Lord. When you say, Jesus, imagine a good life. Ah, the life I have with the Father. That's the good life. Eternal life. How to feel like, how to feel and be like God. Having no beginning and no end. Hey! That is major. Right? And that's the one we are talking about. He has given you that one. I hope I'm making it. So now your love will go where? To him. So what do you think the Lord is telling you? Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your... What is he telling you? He's saying that you need to come to a place where you can love God. So in that place, what is he trying to get you? To bring you to an end of yourself. To say that, no, I'm a wretched, wretched man. I cannot love God. All I love is money. Who can open my eyes? Who can take away the, the blindness that the death has, has put upon me? The death in Adam, he has covered me with blindness. All I see is that money is what will justify me. Money is what will make me as I ought to be. I need somebody to heal my blindness so that I can see that the life that can truly justify me is the life into which Christ was raised. And that's why Christ came. He said that for judgment I came into this world. That I will open what? The eyes of the blind. Now you understand me. He's trying to show you the life which will truly what? Justify you. So Christ is the end of the law in that it comes to explain that what the law is demanding from you is not found in you performing the law, but in me. And this law is talking about me. Praise the Lord. So the law is there to prophesy about who? Jesus. To talk about who? Jesus. So the Bible tells you that in the law, that when you sin, what should you do? Bring a lamb. Who is that lamb? Jesus. Right? Put your hand on the... Uh, the, the the head of the lamb and confess the sins of all the people over the head of, head of the lamb. What is he talking about? Jesus. That Christ will come, that Christ will be baptized into our sin. So at the baptism, they are putting their hand on Jesus. Anyone who enters, who enters into that water, what do you think he's doing? Eh? All his sins are gathered into one place and they are putting the person there so that all of sin will come upon him. When all of sin came upon him, what did the father say? This my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Why? Because he has done the will of God, which is he to be the lamb that will carry the sins of this world. Now, I hope I'm making sense here. So, the law is prophesying about who? Jesus. I hope I'm making sense here. It's not there for us to keep it. It's not there for us to uh, uh, keep it to have life. Now, in the sense of morality, because of time. There, can you say that we should be immoral? We should live anyhow. How can a dead person live anyhow? Have you asked yourself that question? You said you have been crucified with Christ, so you are dead. So how can dead people be living? So that the living will not be anyhow. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. I hope I make sense here. He said, I, the eye has been what? Crucified. The troublesome person is the eye. And if the eye is dead, how can we who are dead to
to sin. You see how Paul put it? Live therein. You know what it means to be dead to sin? To be dead to sin simply means to be dead to the burden of you preserving your own life by the strength of your own hands. That's the meaning of it. What is sin at the cross? If we say this is sin, what will be sin at the cross? He trying to preserve his own life. He coming down from the cross. When they are saying, tell him, you said that you can, you can destroy the temple and bring it back in three days. Save yourself. Prove it. Prove it. You see, they are pressuring him. They are pressuring him. Why do, why do you think they are pressuring him? To save himself. So saving yourself is what? Sin. Taking the burden of preserving your own life is what? Sin. Taking the burden of giving yourself eternal life is what? Sin. So if you say, I will take the law and I will do the law, then I will get life. What do you think you are doing? You are saving yourself. Now you understand it. Eh? So Jesus, he did, not, he did not look to his own ability to preserve his life. But he's come to show us how we will be preserved. That's why he's illuminating. He's throwing light on the way unto life and immortality. How is he throwing it? He's showing how he got his immortality. How did he get it? He committed his desire for life into the Father's hands. Do you know what we call that? The fear of the Lord. So when you say somebody fears God, do you know what it means? His hope is in God's unfailing love to deliver him from death and to preserve his life. Then we say the person fears God. And that's why the Bible said, Jesus prayed. He prayed to who? To God. And God heard him. Hebrews, right? And why did God hear him? Because he feared God. Meaning, if you don't fear God, God does not hear you. Simple as that. It's full stop. Obon, oh, much, you know, oh, blood. Praise the Lord. And you don't fear God. He doesn't listen to you. He doesn't hear you. He can't. He can't do anything to help you. You know why? Because you are in self-preservation. You are preserving your own life. You are living at the, with the strength of your own hand. You are under the curse. Look at the Bible says that. Curse is the man who lives by what? The strength of his own hands. Praise the Lord. Who makes his arm his strength? Jesus at the cross, he didn't make his arm his strength. Rather, he depended on the saving strength of the Father's hand. That's why the Bible says, some trust in chariots and some in horses. But I will trust in the name of the Lord my God. You see, he said that I will not trust in anything in this world, the systems of this world. I will not put my trust in my own ability to preserve my own life. That is the thing that the cross is teaching us. And he said that if you are able to get it and see the way unto life, in that day, in that very day, you will be crucified with Christ. You will be what? Crucified with and from Christ. that day, you will not be the one living anymore. It will be Christ living in you. The old man has been put off. The new man has been put on. The old man is who? The man who depends on his own works. The new man is who? The one who depends on God. That's what the Bible says. Put off the old man. Put on the new man. The old man, when you continue in the old man trying to preserve your own life, do you know what it will bring forth in you? The works of the flesh. Let me give you, let me show you because of time. I'll show you why, how it happens. I'll give you in short form how it happens. If right now, I'm sitting here, you remove iPhone 15, and I see the iPhone 15, right? Get slight and I can cock a fake corn, I can clear screen, right? Coffee crap in the picture quality. The moon here, iPhone 1. <laughs> when I look at your iPhone 5 and I look at my iPhone 1, I said, Oh, Derek, maybe. Here I could tool my tray. Then I'll go to 4, then 5. 6, 7, 8, 9. When will I arrive at 15? Hey, my na eh. In that iPhone 15 coin. In that iPhone 15 coin. My life will be good. Are you are you following me? If right now we, you enter Trotro, eh, and there's a man sitting by you, he has iPhone 15, he was getting down and then he, he fell on the seat. He got down and then he left. The iPhone 16, 15 is, is staring at you. <laughs> what will you say? <laughs> God has answered my prayer. <laughs> Bruh, it is stealing. <laughs> I hope I'm making sense here. You, are, you, are, you take the phone and then you justify that God has given you a phone. Meanwhile, you are stealing. That person did not give you the phone. Like, the person didn't say, uh, I have a phone and I want to give it to you, so take it. That person unintentionally left the phone behind. So the best thing you do as a child of God, is to give the phone back to the owner. But then you have convinced yourself through stealing 
That is from God. You are doing still, you know, and then you are attaching God's name to it. The same way Pharisees can kill Jesus and attach God to it. I hope I made sense here. They are killing him, and they are saying that we, we are, we are the children of Abraham. He said, if you are truly the children of Abraham, Abraham saw my days and he rejoiced. If you are truly the children of Abraham, you will be loving me, not seeking to kill me. These people are going to kill him and they are going to justify it with scripture. I hope I'm making sense here. Uh, so what killing is killing the words of the flesh. Still is the words of the flesh. How did it come? It came at the point when you thought in your heart that you don't have what you need for life. Meanwhile, God has said that in giving you my life, I've given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. You are complete in Christ Jesus, lacking in nothing. So at every point in time in your life, you are what? Complete. The day you feel incomplete, you fall to temptation. Praise the Lord. And the next thing you do is you preserve your life. In the self-preservation, that is where the works of the flesh manifest. Praise the Lord. Where somebody insults you right now? I said, what would they look for? If somebody wants to insult you, what will you look for? Something that you lack. So when he mentioned that thing, and you agree with that person, what do you think will happen to you? You feel anger. And then when the anger comes, what else will come? Yeah? You have to do something. You have, because the person has taken your peace. He has taken some, some joy away from you. He has touched something. He has touched, that's why you say, I saw him. I saw him. I saw him. Right? It has hit some chord. Right? That one, when they insult you like that. Eh? Or let me say, maybe you don't have a child, right? Maybe you are married for a long time, you don't have a child. And at the marketplace, somebody said, Oh, I get to my one, no, oh, Muslim beef. Eh? You see, I'm all kinds of too. And when you hear that, you don't have a child, and they are calling you a witch, and you have been chewing your children, that thing will hit what? A chord. Or oh, from that place, what do you think you are going to do? You are going to save yourself. Thank you. So, the saving yourself will manifest in what? A work of the flesh. Which will be what? To insult the person back. So, you too, you look at the person and look at something. Look at his body. Look at his nose. Look at the shoe he's wearing. But what time no not going to Praise the Lord. And when you release that bullet, eh, and it hits the person, the person starts crying, then you feel what? Peace. Meaning that you are supplying yourself with peace by the strength of your own hands. Meanwhile, it is God who gives what? Peace. And he gave you that peace in you knowing that you are sharing in a life that cannot be touched by any insult. You are sharing in a life that cannot be touched by the tribulation of this world. And this is why you don't find Christ insulting. This is why you don't find Christ fighting. When they came to arrest him, do you know what Peter did? He was going to fight. <laughs> he was going to save him. He said, my friend, our kingdom, we don't do this. <laughs> Eh? You people, you don't learn. When we were going uh, we were on, uh, on some, some area, you said I should call fire from heaven. I didn't do it. I still you are going to remove sword. When will you start learning? <laughs> our kingdom don't behave like that. You see, we don't preserve our own lives. Look, there's nothing that they can do with us without God's permission. <laughs> you see how he thinks? There's nothing that can be done to us. Something that God does not know about. My friend, put the sword down. Put the sword what? Down. Jesus, you never find Jesus in self-preservation. Never. He doesn't save himself. He's totally surrounded to the Father. He's totally surrounded to the will of the Father. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I can bet you, sometimes you wake up in the morning. You wake up in the morning, though. You have not done anything wrong. But you end up as counterback. And you've not done anything wrong, though. But situations can maneuver and you'll be a counterback. And I can bet you that God knows about it. Right? And at the counterback, you'll be looking for a way to come out. And you'll be consumed with you trying to come out rather than asking God, why am I here? <laughs> Meanwhile, there's a person in that jail that needs to hear Jesus at that day. And you are the one that has been sent there. But you can't see it. Because you are so much into what? Self-preservation. Look, there's a lot to talk about self-preservation. But what will quench self-preservation in your life? Eh? So that you'll be always doing the will of God. 
is if you can share in the faith of Christ, the belief which was in his heart when he was hanging on the cross. And we cannot exhaust this today. I want to pause here. Tomorrow we'll continue. I hope you have been blessed. I hope you have been blessed. So please, tomorrow you come early. I know some had rehearsal, but tomorrow no rehearsal. No rehearsal doesn't mean you don't come to church. Praise the Lord. If you don't come tomorrow, no more people. Praise the Lord. Yeah, it means that you are not following him. You have to wholly follow the Lord. Praise the Lord. Kone uh, Chomboni. Discipleship. Say discipleship. What you are doing is called discipleship. It's Christ discipling us. He said, my sheep knows my voice. And what do they do? What do they do? They follow him. So if you are a sheep, like uh, Bishop is saying, we have, in this church we have what? Sheep, we have what? You know what goats do? Goats are those who are in self-preservation. Sheep are those who, who surrender to Jesus. That's the difference. Any question? I think we are done. Any question? Last question. Uh -huh. Praise God, man of God. Hallelujah. Uh, my question is about your last statement. Okay. That uh, Bishop has boldly declared that in this church you have goats and you have sheep. Yeah. Should it be an offensive statement? Because people feel like if you say that you are openly rebuking uh, people and others who probably you are favoring them. So how should we uh, marry the two? Those who are behaving like goats, how should we deal with them? Sometimes, uh, the reason why I'm saying this is sometimes you can clearly see that this fellow is trying to cause a problem in the church. Mm -hmm. It is not once. Mm -hmm. It is not twice. Mm -hmm. It is not thrice. Mm -hmm. That is the person's character. The person has intentionally decided not to grow, mm -hmm. but to cause problem. Probably if he wants to leave, the person will rather uh, very good. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with such a person and such situation? What, what must you do? Okay. That's my first question. Mm -hmm. My second question is that um, you said that uh, if Christ were to be here, mm -hmm. yes, that, that was the inference I drew from all that you said. If Christ were to be here physically, mm -hmm. he would be some way, somehow disappointed in the way we are conducting ourselves as Christians. But we tend to favor some people. When you see somebody riding in probably an expensive car, there is an approach towards that person, and the opposite is true. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can't we say that we are behaving hypocritically? That is it. Okay, so that is my question. Yeah, okay. it's hypocrisy, All right. actually. That's the word, hypocrisy. Professing to be something you are not. So, is it wrong to make such statement when you see such? Uh, behavior has been exhibited. Yes. It's wrong. It's correct okay. to say it. Thank you. And I'm not just saying, I'm not a person who is saying it. Actually, all my teachings are the epistles. I'm just talking about the epistles. When I was talking about you treating people partially, like showing partiality when treating people like how you do, based on what they have, because you seek the justification, justification the things of this world, right? I'm taking it from James. You see, James said the same thing. Yeah, so I'm just announcing what James said. You see, everything I teach, you find in the Bible. I'm not saying anything new. I'm just explaining what is in the epistles to you. Right? So what's, that's what James said. And the rebukes, right? When somebody is in your church, that causes division in your church. The Bible makes it clear that you should rebuke that person. Sharply. Not even just small rebuke, sharp one. You get me? It's in the epistles. You rebuke the person sharply. One thing that God hates is in the book of Proverbs. It's a man who sees so discord among brethren. So once you are bringing division, you can't tell that God, Jesus is smiling at you. Yeah, do it. Continue. My grace is sufficient. No, it doesn't work like that. You rebuke the person. And not just rebuking the person, but you show the person why he's behaving the way he's behaving. And then you turn the person onto the way, onto life. The reason why people bring division in groups is because they want to be leaders. If you make them leaders, they'll push their own agenda. 
And the reason why they don't, you don't make, because you don't make them leaders, and you have made another person leader, then you try to break that group. They both of them. Praise the Lord. I hope I'm making sense here. So, why is the person behave that, behaving that way? Because he thinks that being a leader is what will justify him. That is why he's behaving the way he's behaving. So, you, you, you immediately you remind the person that, look here, you being a leader is not what will justify you. If you do so, then you are a vote. You are just like the Pharisees. Because they also seek the front seats. You see, they seek what? The front seats. They want to be leaders. Right? He says, he said that when the one who, 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 is, who held the party, eh, the master of the party arrives, eh, he will take you and put you at their back. This is it. He said it to who? To Pharisees. They love to be leaders. Meanwhile, they don't allow God to raise them as leaders. If God raises you as a leader, that means that you have a servant's heart. Meaning that you have your, the self, the I, has been crucified with Christ. And now it is Christ that lives in you. And Christ, he does not come to be, to ser- to be served, but to serve. So when Christ is in you, you begin to have what? A servant's heart. And you find yourself what? Serving. I don't know if I make sense here. Uh, I hope I make sense here. Yeah. So rebukes are part of like preaching. In fact, the Bible says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's, pr- it's profitable for, for correction, for, for instruction. Uh-huh. So rebukes are part of it. Praise the Lord. It's there to rebuke sharply. Praise the Lord. So if you come here, you find all. Oh, pr- I preach the gospel. I rebuke. Bishop preached. He rebuke. Right? Sunday, didn't he rebuke? Yeah, he did. He did. And, and somebody, who, when he's rebuking, you find people say, Mercy. Mercy. It is mercy because of mercy that is rebuking. I hope I'm making sense here. To correct somebody shows that you love the person. Hey, if somebody hates you and you are going to fall in the gutter, do you know what the person will say? Oh, you are doing well. <laughs> you are doing well. Oh, it is well with you. And that will make that time. Say, hey, careful. Because does he love you? If a person truly loves you, he will turn you around. I hope I make sense here. Yeah. If we say we love people, it's not like we are treating them like, I don't know. Oh, I don't have to say anything. You know, it's, it's grace. Grace. The grace will, will solve everything. It's grace. They don't understand grace. Praise the Lord. Grace doesn't mean no rebuke. Grace is... <laughs> when you talk about grace, it doesn't... Or you love a person, it doesn't mean uh, I love my daughter, so I can't rebuke my daughter. So if I find somebody correcting my daughter, I, I have to I have to, I have to beat the person. Why should you correct my daughter? No. Rebuke is part of what? Love. A father that loves you will what? Rebuke you sharply. And then turn you around. Our rebuke is not different from... Our rebuke is different from the rebukes of the world. Right? If you being fathers, when you are correcting your children, let's say you are watching TV, your child is making noise. What do you do? Keep quiet. I'm a keep quiet. Yeah. I said keep quiet. You take the key. Hey, I said, come here, come here. Keep quiet, keep quiet. Go, go, go. Go and sleep. Go and sleep. Go and sleep. You see, you are correcting the child to your own benefit. Can't you see? Your own benefit. You want to enjoy your movie in quietness. So you are going to beat the child. When you come to God, he doesn't correct for his own benefit. He corrects for your benefit. So that you enjoy eternal life. So that you enjoy his life. That's why he said that put away your feeble heart. Tomorrow will continue. Uh, I hope you have been blessed. Okay. Yeah. I just want to add on. Mm-hmm. In the, in the church, it's not everyone who is saved. It's not everyone who comes enters the church yeah. that is saved. We have people, unbelievers, mm. who act as if they are saved. They don't know God, mm. but they still come to church. Mm. They, so you have wolves. If he's saying we have wolves, goats, and all that, we have people who are not saved. Mm-hmm. They are not uh, the new creation. Mm-hmm. They don't have God's life. Mm-hmm. They can't even bear any fruit mm-hmm. because they don't have God's life. Mm-hmm. And we have people who are probably saved but are not maturing. Mm-hmm. And then we have people mm-hmm. who are saved mm-hmm. and are maturing. Thank you. All sitting in one church. And these, when, they, when you see them exhibiting their fruits, that's where you can tell them apart. 
But now, you, 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 that's when you were praying that, oh, the, uh, separate uh, the wheat uh, the, the sheep from, from the goats. He said, no. He said, wheat from the tares. Yes. Good. Because he said, he said, wait and let them grow. grow. So that we'll see. But that's the, the only way you can tell them apart. Yeah. I can't come and say, you are a woman. Until I be saved. You, you are, are not saved. A, you, are you, you are saved. You are not saved. I can't tell because I can't enter your heart. It's uh -huh. by their fruits. It's only by their fruits. So your character to, that I can tell. Yeah. So they have to grow before you can tell them. So unless people grow, you can't really tell who is saved and who is not. And secondly, um, you say, um, you see, some people they will preach. Maybe they will preach breaking orders. And then when they feel, they say, if you are here, I've not received the Lord as your personal savior. Come forward. Then you also go. It says, say this after me. Lord Jesus. They say, Lord Jesus. Uh, I, give, I give you my life. Say, I give you my life. Say, I give you my life. Oh, Lord, come and live in my heart and be my Lord and Savior. They say, from today, you are saved. So look for a Bible-believing church. And you don't find one we are here. <laughs> my friend, run for your life. <laughs> it's not even one of them. And then, when you move from there, do you know what you say? I'm a believer. I've been saved. True or false? Have you been saved? No. Saying that prayer cannot save you. Salvation is not a prayer thing. The Bible said, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Now you understand it. You must hear a specific gospel so that that gospel will unveil the belief which was in the heart of Jesus so that you can share in that belief so that you will be crucified with him. Then you can say you are saved. A man, you are still living here and you are saved. Did Jesus get a new body uh, before salvation and uh, before the cross or after the cross? So you two, how will you have a body? Before or after the cross? That is why I said you should come to the cross. Come to the message of the cross. That is what will crucify you with Jesus. I hope I'm making sense here. Then you say you believe. Believing means that you have moved away from what? Self-preservation. Thank you. I hope I'm making sense here. So not everybody who comes to church understands the message of the cross. In fact, do you know what he said? He said, the, the, good, the good soil a soil sows the seed. It falls on a good soil. The good soil is what? The one who hears the word, understands, and believes it. Which one came for first? Understands. So if you don't understand the word, you can't believe it. When we are saying we believe, you also say, I believe. I believe. I'm a believer, my friend. You are not. I'm an immigration. You are not. You are just a goat among us. Praise the Lord. But when you come to understand, then you will be what? Sheep. Praise the Lord. He said, hey, why you don't understand? Hey, why you talk? I don't understand. Then this gospel cry. I don't know this grace, 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 grace. I don't understand. You don't understand because you don't have the ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. We don't speak just words. We speak words that the Spirit gives to communicate spiritual truths. Now you understand? So the carnal man cannot understand what I am saying. You let me pause here. Tomorrow we'll continue. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How many people believe that the way unto life is by setting your hope on the unfailing love of, G of Jesus to deliver you from death? Then you are a believer. Praise the Lord. Yeah, don't be confused about that one. Praise the Lord. It means you have understood what? The gospel. Praise the Lord. Now stay in that. Don't move. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you, O oh Lord, for being with us, O oh Lord, and teaching us, O oh Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who guided us into all truth and continues to guide us into all truth. We pray, O oh Lord, that we will not live here, O oh Lord, the same way we came here. That's Lord, wherever there is confusion, O oh Lord, you will lift that confusion, O oh Lord. Wherever there is burden, O oh Lord, you will lift that burden, O oh Lord. We commit ourselves into your hands, our families into your hands, O oh Lord. You know everything that we are going through is by the saving strength of your hands that will come out. Therefore, we commit ourselves and cast all our burdens onto you so that you will lift us up in due time. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Shall we give our offerings? Hmm? Just come around, just come around and call it a detail.
Gracious and wonderful God, we thank you once again and we give you the praise for what you have done for us. Yes, we thank you for the understanding that is prevailing now and therefore the level at which you have brought us far. We thank you tonight, your Lord, once again for even all those who are not here. It is by the collection of understanding that we will be able to travel to the level as you want us to be. So we thank you tonight for revealing and opening that door unto us. We thank you also for the one that you have used that yes continue to grant you more understanding that it will lead and therefore grant us more understanding through the gospel we also thank you for life of our bishop continue to strengthen him causing the over god to grow to the level at which you have made him to be we also thank you for all the life of every member here they came in the anomalies therefore lord we pray that no one is living here the same you have already provided let all manifest in the life of the people even if anyone is sick among us we thank you that the person is healed in the name of jesus tomorrow we are coming back we thank you lord that taking you have taken us to our various home the brothers back tomorrow thank you lord bless the offering as well in jesus name say amen share the grace the love of god Surely, all the days of our life, we shall go in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Tell somebody you are blessed. God bless you all. Tomorrow, 6 o'clock, please. 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock on the dot. God bless you. This preceding program was supported by friends and partners of Calvary Crystal Church International. To be a partner, call 055-080-2220. I hope you have been blessed by this program. Please subscribe to our Twitter, Facebook, YouTube channels and share with friends and family. God bless you.